You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 475, 1 Samuel 26. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland. He's the scholar, Dr. Ron Johnson. Hey, Ron. How you doing? Hey, Trey. Good to talk to you again. Yes, yes. And you have some other sad news to tell us about um, Dr. Carl Sanders. I do. Yeah, I, many of the listeners here uh, know Carl Sanders. Dr. Carl Sanders, a good friend of my, uh, Mike's over the years. He's my brother-in-law. And so there were several times that we talked together with Mike, um, often at an ETS or an SBL. We were, we were always there together, but sometimes Mike would talk with us and make an episode. And well, Carl had cancer uh, around the same time period that Mike did. And for about a year and a half, he battled uh, stomach cancer and he passed away uh, two weeks after Mike did. And uh, uh, I'm going to be heading off to his memorial this weekend, in fact. So just an unbelievable turn of events where I would honestly say my my two heroes of the faith, present day you know, buddies in the faith, I guess I call it, buddies but heroes because of how they conducted their lives as well. Uh, yeah. I, I lost them both in two weeks. So and unbelievable, but yeah. it's a good, a good reminder that we're here to get out of here in one sense and God is doing something bigger than us. Yeah, absolutely. Hate to hear that. Prayers for his family and you. And also, if you want to go back, we interviewed Carl and you and Mike, all three of you all together at the ETS conferences. I think one episode is episode 245 of the Deca Bible Podcast. So you can go back there. And check that out. And then we have another one, and we've got a picture of all three of y'all on the website at NakedBiblePodcast.com website, where you can take a look of uh, y'all chatting it up. Those are good memories. I enjoyed those mm-hmm. conversations. Probably the most out of all of the conference, because y'all were so close and friends, and so y'all would kind of let your hair down and, and cut up a little bit, and mm-hmm. so that was always fun to listen to. Yeah, I to- that's totally how I saw it, too. Just a good time to... Uh, shoot the bull is, you know, in a theological sense and uh, have a good time. Yeah, so. absolutely. All right. Well, we're here today for chapter 26 of 1 Samuel, and uh, I'm ready if you are. I am. Yeah, thank you. So uh, 1 Samuel 26, we're continuing the narrative of uh, really what uh, uh, 1 Samuel 15, 23 and on is doing is getting rid of Saul. God is replacing Saul, whom he has rejected as the king. And as I said, when I was last with you for chapter 23, um, from all indications, Saul was not a Yahwist, from what I can tell. So uh, when you carry a divine counsel worldview into the biblical story, that makes a big difference, right? And so uh, at, at, at the end of Saul's life, it looks like the narrative will say in 1 Samuel 31 that he dies on, on Gilboa. But First Chronicles 10, 13, and 14 says very bluntly, God killed him which is not language that would remind you of a Yahwist. This is someone who has not ever claimed I would recommend Yahweh. But anyway, today in chapter 26, the narrative is that David is running from Saul. Uh, He will refuse to kill him for the second time, but he's also going to be conversing with him. And wouldn't you know it again, but the divine counsel worldview really uh, makes a difference in how you interpret this chapter, both in how David acts and also especially what he says. So let's get into it. Chapter 26, verse 1. Now the Ziphites, they're going to rat out David again where he is, came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hekelah, which is opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Dropping down to verse 5. So David arose and came to the place where Saul was encamped, and David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp, probably surrounded. And then David answered and said to Abimelech, or I'm sorry, Ahimelech, the Hittite. By the way, that, that, that's an interesting name. Ahimelech is a Semitic name, but he has pagan ancestry. He's a Hittite, so he's probably a, a, a proselyte. Uh, to the Jewish army and changed his name, Ahimelech the Hittite. And so Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, the brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And uh, Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai, that's his nephew, by the way, came to the people by night 
And there Saul lay sleeping within the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your... He probably whispered this, by the way. God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I and I will not have to strike him a second time. And David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? This is the second time. And he's going to say this numerous times, Yeah, uh, that Saul is... Yahweh's Mashiach, his anointed one. Of course, Mashiach is where we get the, the title of Messiah. So uh, just a bit about this. Again, Mashiach or Mashiach just means to anoint or to smear with oil. Uh, it's not a capital M. In other words, there never was a capital M Messiah in the Old Testament or you know the one. In fact, the title, the Christ, will will be placed upon Jesus, of course, in the New Testament, but there's no text of the Old Testament that talks about the Messiah. So what you have is a pretty common idea of, of someone being chosen or anointed for a task. It's not a religious idea. In fact, uh, we have priests, uh, we, have, we have numerous kings, we have Saul here, uh, David will later be called the Mashiach uh, prophets. First Chronicles 16, you have them de described as anointed. So Judges, kings, prophets, warriors, even someone like Cyrus, who's not a Yahwist, in, in Isaiah 44 and 45, is called a, messi, a, a messianic figure or a messiah. So it's a growing concept uh, throughout the Old Testament. It's a very Jewish concept to this day. Uh, a Jew today does expect a messiah to come. The difference between Christians and Jews is we believe he has come. They believe he has not yet come. Uh, they would say, this is again just speaking of what a Jew would expect the Messiah to be, they would not expect him to be a deity, uh, not a co-ruler with Yahweh by any means, not worshipable. They, they would argue that you would not worship a Messiah. Uh, he would not be a source of individual salvation. You know, these, these things that we, uh, that we attach to Jesus because of our Christian theology, uh, in the sense of what a Messiah would be on the, on the, uh, you know, going forward or looking ahead in the Old Testament, uh, a lot of those things are not part of their thinking when it comes to Messiah. So whatever happens between 1 Samuel 26 and when Jesus is said by Peter, Matthew 16, you know, you are the Christ, or John 11, Martha says you are the Christ, those kind of phrases, the Christ, whatever happens between 1 Samuel 26 and the New Testament, is certainly a maturing and a, even a traveling concept called the Messiah. So we can't really go to the Old Testament for um, an entrenched idea of a coming person called a Messiah. Now, of course, we have coming one, and we have a lot of other things we can say, like a suffering servant and other texts that we can put together. But the word Messiah that um, David uses for Saul here is rather limited in how, how much we can get out of it. And and I wouldn't sanitize or romanticize the text or David. Uh, he was a brutal man. He was cruel uh, as a warrior. And so when he says, let's not kill him, I don't romanticize that moment. I just see his Yahwism in action, as it were. He's saying, in fact, he even says it. Let's keep reading. David said, furthermore, this is verse 10. As Yahweh lives, kind of a creed uh, a, or a creedal way of talking. As Yahweh lives, Yahweh shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against Yahweh's anointed one, Yahweh's Messiah. But please take now the spear and jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So he takes his uh, spear, the water jug. They go across this rather deep valley. And here's where if you visit Israel, you've got to go to En Gedi because you can see the gorge uh, that would be probably in view here, where you can literally stand across from someone, maybe 30, 50 yards, you know, not very far, and you can have a conversation with them, but the gorge is so steep and so deep that you know you're safe. If you if all they have is a spear, there's no way they can hurt you. So he teases Abner, will not read these verses, but he teases Abner for saying you should have, you know, you should face the firing squad for being so lax. My five-pound Yorkie here sleeping at my feet could have done a better job. He probably is is teasing him for uh, protecting Saul. Well, uh, Saul speaks up in verse 17. 
He wakes up, sees what happens, and Saul says, Saul knew David's voice and said, Is that your voice, my son David? Now, there's there's where a good example of the word son, Ben in Hebrew, is a term of endearment. It's not necessarily a word of uh, you know begetting someone physically. We've talked in this Divine Council discussion of Bene Elohim, or sons of the gods. Again, son can be very broad in meaning. Intimacy can be, like in this sense, used there. Is that your voice, my son, David? And David said, it is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, why does my lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? And as we come to verse 19, look for a divine counsel worldview that's quite clear in the text. It's in the mouth of, again, David. I I I presume David to be, and this has been in my head for a long time, that David is the consummate theologian of the Old Testament, uh, if if not of all the Bible. And the reason I can say that is because when you get to the New Testament, this is a separate discussion, I think we often make the mistake of thinking of New Testament writers as theologians more than what I would take to mean or take to be more uh, more of uh, midrashists, midrashists or someone who goes back into the story and expounds its meaning, searches, that's the idea of a midrash, you search the text to find meaning. You don't, and here's the point, you don't create new theology. And I think one of the weaknesses of, may I even talk about my own evangelical tradition, is that we make Paul to be a theologian, when Paul would, I think, turn over in his grave if he found out how much we take his words to overdo or, or, or change the story of the Bible. So, obviously, this isn't a this isn't a discussion about the New Testament. But my point is that when we come upon David saying something like he's going to say in verse nineteen, I'd recommend that we listen to him and even take his words to be true. Okay, now when we say that, I know it sounds good on the on on the front side, but listen to what David says. Verse 19, now therefore, please let my servant, or let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him offer an offer, or let let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, bene adam, there is that word ben meaning classification of, or sons of the man, sons of mankind, meaning he's a human class being. You see the difference there? If Yahweh has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it's a man thing, if it's a human issue that we're dealing with, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day. Here's what Saul's men have done. They have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of Yahweh. Okay, that's the idea, again, of much of what we've talked about in of Mike's work is that back in Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 19, Deuteronomy 32, that God has allotted to the nations, divine beings, to rule over those nations on Yahweh's behalf. Listen to it again. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of Yahweh, Israel, saying, and remember they had driven him to Moab, go serve other Elohim. Cosmic Geography 101, right? He's, he's complaining to Saul that he was kicked out of Israel or forced out of Israel and had to go live in Moab, which, again, in the ancient worldview, uh, that, again, this consummate theologian, I think he's honestly talking the truth here, that when you cross the border in the ancient world, a border in the ancient world, you're expected to serve the Elohim allotted to that territory. Yahweh controlled Israel, and if he crosses the border into Moab, he had to serve Chemosh. That's just how David thought. And if you don't serve Chemosh, well, a worse thing will happen to thee, right? I mean, in other words, you're taking your life in your hands by not just the people of Moab, but the God of Moab. So if we say to that, well, no, he's just kind of talking mythology, or he's uh, David's just expressing himself in the terms of that ancient world, my challenge back would be, well, name a time that David doesn't believe this. This is clearly his frustration with Saul that he's been uh, caused or forced to go into a different land, quote, to go serve other gods. So we've been through these texts before, but, you know, they they are um, good ones to, to look at. Second Kings 5, 17 and 18, where Naaman wants to put two bags of dirt on his donkeys to go back and uh, 
worship Yahweh in his own territory up in Syria. The reason he does that is because he believes what David says. When you go across a border, you are destined to serve the God of that new nation or that that, that other nation. Uh, Ezekiel 20, I'm going to read this one because it's uh, right on topic here. In Ezekiel 20, verse 24, because they have not executed my judgments, but have despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols, talking about the exiles now, Therefore, I also gave them up to statutes that were not good and judgments by which they could not live. When Israel was forced to go into Babylonia, God is admitting through Ezekiel that they were forced to live under statutes that, as he says, were not good. I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts and that they caused all their firstborn to pass through the fire, speaking of child sacrifice and such. And you can go all the way down to Oh, verse 32, we'll, you know, we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries, serving wood and stone. That's what the Israelites were thinking, and that's why God sent them into exile. Uh, we talked about it before, but uh, Deuteronomy 32, this cosmic geography issue becomes prevalent when in verse 22 of Genesis 32, he crosses over the ford of the Jabbok. It's the first mention of the Jabbok River in the Bible. And if you look it up in the Yale Anchor Bible Dictionary, the Jabbok is the border of Sihon's kingdom. So, again, just think common sense here in the ancient world. If I'm crossing a border, I am walking into the territory of not just another people group, but another god. And wouldn't you know the next thing he has this wrestling match with a divine being. And uh, there's a, this is a good case where you take the capital G off Genesis 32, verse 28. Uh, he struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Take the capital G off. Use the uh, the uh, the Hebrew Bible, the uh, Jerusalem Publication Society here, the Jewish Publication Society Bible, and it has you have struggled with a divine being and have prevailed. So they don't see Yahweh there. They see an evil an evil God that has tried to kill Jacob. So again, what we're just seeing in in uh, just a quip of David. In 2619 is a very strong sense of a divine council worldview, cosmic geography. Uh, 21. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Now, would we expect a non Yahwist to repent of his sins? I think they do it all the time. I think it's bound deep within the heart of humanity to be sorry for one's sins when you're caught, right? So I, I don't take this as any kind of hint that Saul has a kind heart toward Yahweh or David. I think if he had a chance, he'd kill him still. But of course, he's a politician. So he says, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more. Yeah, right. Because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Again, words of a politician running for office. And David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let, and I love his answer. Let one of the young men come over and get it. I'm, I'm leaving. I have no, no time for you. And if you want to come over and get it, you're welcome to it. Well, we come to uh, 2023. 20, I, uh, I probably, as a Viking fan, give a Viking Super Bowl. I, I, I'd be willing to trade a Viking Super Bowl for changing a moment of history that happened, if I may say so, back in the days of Calvin as he was writing his institutes. You know, a candlelit room one night when Calvin was writing and basically summarizing the theological position of the Reformation one generation later. Calvin's, you know, the first half, well, put it this way, Calvin presumed that the Roman Catholic Church got it, got, got salvation right on the first half of the question. That being, what stands between uh, heaven and hell, or what causes a person to go from hell to heaven? And he came up with, because the Catholic Church had it as well, and that is the forgiveness of sins. The thing keeping you out of heaven is the forgiveness of sins. Now, what Calvin disagreed with the Catholic Church about, and so did Luther, was the second half of that question, and that is the how question. How are you forgiven? And Calvin and others said, not indulgences, not the priesthood. It comes, you know, in the finished work of Christ. 
So I understand and I appreciate the, the Reformation for what it answered, but I'd recommend that we could have gone back farther even to the days of, well, here we have it, 1 Samuel 26, verse 23. So, like I say, if I, I'd give up a, a lot more than maybe a Viking Super Bowl, maybe my left arm, but the idea of if we could have traded out the Reformation idea that forgiveness of sins was the key to getting into heaven, and instead take David's words of 1 Samuel 26, 23, everything would have been different. So listen to it. May the Lord, Yahweh, repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. Here's the problem. We often tell people how to get saved by telling them to accept the privileges of being a Christian. So we'll talk about sins forgiven and, and asking God into your heart or those kind of things asking him to forgive your sins, when really, listen to how David would have described the gospel. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. Now, righteousness is tzedekah, a um, very common word in the Old Testament, not even a religious word. It just means to be right, to be proper, and it's used in non-legal uh, sense almost all the time. I, 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 I really uh, get nervous when I hear people say that sedeka or righteousness is a legal idea. I would almost challenge anyone show me one time that it's in a legal context. It's almost never in a legal uh, context in the Old Testament, nor dikaiosune in the New Testament. Righteousness, you know, the word righteousness in the Greek. Um, it's a simple, straightforward idea of being proper, whether it's fixing a wagon wheel or a person's standing with God, even. I guess you could say it that way. But listen to that second word. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his amunah. Aman is the word for faith. Amunah is the word for, it's just the adjective, faithful. So his faithfulness, it's a word that occurs, amunah, 49 times in the Old Testament, translated as steady, uh, once as a nurse who cares for a baby, a nursing mother. Let's, in fact, read, I want to show you 30, look at Psalm 36, 5. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and your amunah reaches to the clouds. Translated as faithfulness. 37, 3, Psalm 37, 3. Trust in Yahweh, do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Same word. What's interesting then, when you think about it, is David is saying, the Lord will repay a man according to the very thing that Yahweh has too and that Yahweh demands of people. So what is Amunah? It's simple, and and, and, and Mike talked about this. I, I, I loved it when he talked about believing loyalty. It's, he, he, uh, Mike wasn't making up a concept there. He was simply taking the word for what it stands for. And so Habakkuk 2.4, uh, the just will live by his Amunah, by his loyalty. So in the Old Testament, the gospel was, which Elohim do you love? Simple as that. And the Lord would repay or reward or give righteousness or consider a person righteous if they simply followed the wishes of Yahweh as opposed to any other God. So that's why the divine counsel worldview, again, I'm finding just screaming out of our text here today. Uh, and David got it right. David noticed that God is rewarding a person, and, and he's saying that to a man, Saul, who, of course, is on the other side of the brick wall. He's saying, as it were, Saul, here's how God works. Unless you're loyal to him, you're in trouble. And so he was saying this, as it were, to an unrighteous man. And, uh, of course, he would have invited him across, but Saul would have none of it. So, the Lord, for the Lord delivered you into my hand, I was righteous, and, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Um, is this in, in, you know, as when I say I would give up almost anything for the Reformation to have been different as to what it preached? Um, it's easy to ask, and I think we should. Well, does the rest of the Bible defend this idea of the gospel that God rewards a person according to their faithfulness? Psalm 7, verse 8, David wrote it, O Lord, judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity within me. Psalm 18, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands. Psalm 18, 24, therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness. 
Psalm 125, 4, do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. Now, the Reformation doctrine is built on the concept that no one is righteous. Well, that's misunderstanding what Paul meant, because in the Old Testament, you clearly have righteous people. David is even saying, God, you have rewarded me according to my righteousness. So if we undo David's theology by starting the conversation by saying no one is righteous, I think we've completely botched it. Uh, we've, we, 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 we've taken, like I say, the greatest theologian of the Old Testament and thrown out his, his, his whole model. Um, when you get to, to Paul in Romans 2, he'll say it this way. You are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who, and I was going to quote Psalm 62, who will render to each according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Again, like, like I say, that's a quote from Psalm 62, 12. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each according to his work. Uh, Proverbs 24, 12 says much the same. Now, and, and I've, you know, been around long enough to know what people say, um, and theologians say, what about Jeremiah 10, or I'm sorry, 17, verse 9? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. What I'd recommend is look at the context. And I'm going to back up and read that passage again, but notice the story of Jeremiah 17, beginning in verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in Yahweh and whose hope is in Yahweh, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by its river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious, anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord. Search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. You see how the text doesn't mean that every man is wicked. The text is saying that God knows who is wicked and who isn't by their heart. God can see inside of a person, whereas you and I can't. So the text isn't saying what the Reformation said it said. And I think it's just a matter of reading the context to figure uh, that out. So I love chapter 26 of 1 Samuel for, again, what David um, shows us, his unwillingness to take the life of a man because he knew that Yahweh was in charge. He's acting like I called, or like I called it, Yahwism in action. He's not going to take the life of a person just because he wants to. Uh, like I say, he will be a cruel warrior at other times. Um, secondly, that phrase, uh, you've forced me to go to Moab to worship another deity. He's just falling right into line with, with what we've learned throughout the Old Testament. And of course, David was not going to worship uh, Chemosh, and that's why he hated being in Moab. And then this uh, righteousness and faithfulness. The reason this is a, a divine council worldview issue, how to define the gospel, is because it's the result, again, of the which Elohim do you worship question. And if there's anything that the Divine Council worldview screams for, it's to to define our, our righteousness, not by the results of being a Christian, and I'd put forgiveness of sins in there, but by the doorway into Christianity, which is which God you worship. And that's why Salvation is always a faith issue in the New Testament. Well, the Old Testament as well. So that'll do it. Thank you, Trey. No, thank you, Ron. That was good. But we're going to have to get you some um, other references besides the Vikings because. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're never going to. You know, yeah, you know, we have a we have a, a, a sports casting duo up here in the Twin Cities, and that's their their tagline. Like you say, I'm the I'm the layman. Mm -hmm. They always start their weekly broadcast with all we want before we die is a Viking Super Bowl before we die. <laughs> all we want, you know, one. So they're, right. they're, they're not asking for the world, but yeah. yeah. Well, well, when you had Case Keenum uh, as quarterback, did you like him? He was a believer and uh, he was a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, he was very good in the, in the locker room and everyone yeah. liked him, but uh, it was a, you know. Yeah. He's actually yeah. from my high school. Get out. Yeah. Yeah. And he graduated from my high school. Do you? Oh yeah. How yeah. old I'm, would he? No, I'm um, he's he's probably 15 years younger than me. What high school is this? Uh, Abilene Wiley. Really? Okay. Yeah. Any other famous people in your high school? Uh, other than me? 
and Case Keenum. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm on par with Case Keenum, right? I mean, NFL quarterback <laughs> and me. So no comparison. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, hey, I, I went back and looked up on the interviews, and it's uh, with you, Carl, and Mike, and it's episode 188 and 245. So for those of you that want to go back and listen to Mike, Ron, and Carl, please go back and do so. They're fantastic. And uh, um, again, our prayers are with Carl's family and with you, Ron. And uh, we appreciate you coming on and helping us complete First Samuel. And with that, I want to thank everybody else for listening to the Mac Bible Podcast. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.